Dr. John Trowbridge, or Dr. T, as he's affectionately known in the past 39 years, claims he is just getting started. He entered practice in 1978, becoming a busy industrial physician, serving 53 area companies, and was chief medical officer of Texas International Airlines. He got uh, disheartened with risk, reactions, and limited results from drugs and surgery, and explored other approaches. His predictable success with puzzling patients is endorsed in over five dozen volumes of Who's Who, and by a Distinguished Lifetime Achievement Award from the International College of Integrated Medicine. The catchphrase for life celebrating health in Houston is, when life is your choice, failure is not an option. He claims every patient deserves leading edge breakthroughs in diagnosis and treatment. Find it now, fix it right. Please welcome Dr. John Trowbridge. You're impressed. <laughs> Isn't that important? It doesn't mean much at all. What it means is that you can have way too much fun practicing medicine, or at least you could in the old days. I'm not so sure it's getting easier now. To start out, I'd like to acknowledge uh, some people, Dr. Simon Yu, who graciously took me on about six years ago to kind of teach me a bit about parasites. Um, and he kept being pushy about parasites. I thought I'd better learn a little bit about it. Dr. Lee Cowden has done phenomenal things educating physicians. I mean, what a thought. That's kind of a hard task, incidentally. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And then one of my dear mentors, Dr. Gary Gordon, saw an excited young physician 34 years ago and kind of encouraged me along and, and made it possible for me to do a lot of the things that I've had fun doing. So let's talk about the elephant in the room to start with. Uh, you know what that is, right? What is that? Nobody knows what the elephant is in the room? Good grief. Well, I don't either, so it's okay. Anybody know anything about yeast? Anybody know about a book called The Yeast Syndrome? Raise your hand if you know about the book. Very good, okay. Raise your hand if you know that I wrote it. A few. Okay, good enough. Uh, at a uh, mycotoxin, inter international mycotoxin, Summit in uh, June of last year, there were 103 doctors there, three of whom knew, that would include me and Dr. Simon, that I wrote the book. They would even knew about the book. Okay. Now, when I say educating doctors is a hard task, I thought, well, you know, that's just, they're holding themselves out as able to treat people who have yeast related problems. So I bought. 100 extra copies of my book, made several copies of our DVDs and CDs, and our brochures that key various illnesses to the book, sent every one of the attendees and the exhibitors a copy of my book so they could be up to speed with the history of what they were claiming to treat. You will not believe the thank you letters. Phenomenal in their lack of any response whatsoever. Zero. None. Now, when I say it's difficult to educate doctors, they can be a little resistant in their arrogance and their ignorance, or their ignorance and their arrogance. You pick, okay? So today we're gonna to talk about the yeast syndrome. Does it represent cancer and more? Or, as I like to ask the question, if I can make this thing work, and check the computer. All right, I'm looking directly at the computer, Steve. I'm in. Where would I click OK? <laughs> Thank you. This is what AV is all about. Mm hmm. <laughs> we're, we're having too much fun at the moment. 
it just made something move. That was good. That was a good sign. Drawbridge right there, if you want to put it on there and click. A little bit up. I just, I don't know, I just point. I, no, we didn't, but is it possible that it'll go forward? If not, I can use the uh, computer. So, let's talk further about arrogance and ignorance, okay? About, about yeah, that's right. There you go, that'll work. About, uh, what, 800,000, 900,000? Is it working? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's working? You're the man, okay? Physicians. And so the real question, thank you so much. The real question is, is there death by doctor? And can you blame those who simply don't know? I mean, you know, when you call a plumber, he doesn't know about your problem, can you blame him? Well, I don't know, I kind of have the feeling that when everything is flooding all over my house, I better have the guy who holds himself out to take care of it. So today well, I really want to talk about deep blood fungus because that is explaining the unexplained illnesses. Now let me give you a brief idea on that for a second, okay? When Pasteur looked in the microscope and said, hey, these little critters probably are causing disease, and that was the beginning of the germ theory of disease. Then we, of course, found out it was streptococcus, and then we got penicillin, so now we've got strep throat, and we can treat it in a whole realm of of bacterial infections that explain problems. And then there's injuries, nutritional deficiencies, toxicities with metal, toxicities with chemicals. And then I leave out genetics because that's just such a small issue overall because epigenetics is the key. You know what that is, lifestyle. And then there's this great unwashed collection of diseases. The cancers, the ALS, the MS, the rheumatoid arthritis, the lupus. Just the list goes on and on and on, the great unwashed. And those are treated with Band-Aids. And the Band-Aids are generally expensive, generally ineffective, and generally just kind of BS, okay? But sounds good, might even feel good, and don't worry, because if you don't like it, we got opioids and cortisone. But we don't have any problems with opioids and cortisone, right? So what have you learned at this conference? Give me some shout outs. What have you learned? Don't everybody talk at once. What have you learned? 65% of the people, what? Oh my gosh, really? Not a 100%? Well, I live in Houston, so, okay. What else? Look in the mouth. Only if you want to have Doug Kaufman around, he has an entertaining mouth. You know, Doug taught me about food allergies in, was it 1980, 1981? It was when I was brand new and really wet behind the ears. Phenomenal stuff. It turns out, well, you'll hear more about food allergies later. Anyway, what else have you learned? This is scary. Simon. What, so nobody was talking to them for the last couple of days? What? Okay. All right, well, basically what I want you to see here is that what you've learned is that there's a lot of stealth illnesses. You just can't see them. You can feel them. But where do they come from? Who knows? How about if you had raccoons in your house? Well, it'd be kind of obvious you would notice the raccoon, okay? If you had mice, that might be a bit more stealthy, okay? Because they're kind of hard to see. It's a matter of, no, wrong mouse, sorry. Uh, another wrong mouse. Sorry about that. But... That's generally about what you see when mice are in the house. As it went streaking by, and was that? It couldn't have been a mouse. Then you put out the trap and find out, yes, that was the tail of the mouse you saw sneaking behind the refrigerator. How many people have had that experience? Yeah, isn't that funny? Okay, so you get to see them, okay. And this is what you see with termites. Nothing. Okay, it's kind of like when you go in to see the doctor. He looks at you and he sees nothing. Now you've got illness on the inside, but the question is, is there an ominous illness on the inside that he is missing because, well, you really can't tell. You know, if you want to put a better deadbolt on your house, it really depends on what's behind that door jamb because they talk with you about using four inch or six inch screws to really lock that in. Well, do you have that much wood behind your door jam 
that can actually make a difference because a lot of the things we do in medicine just don't make a difference. We just don't understand because we don't see what's going on. So you have to learn to live with it. I mean, that what doctors say? Well, you know, Mrs. Smith, you, you, you just have to learn to live with it. Well, we already know how to live with it. We would like to learn to live without it. And the problem is, is what we don't know. 1924, Banting discovered insulin. Suddenly we had an idea about diabetes. It was not just, I don't know, you're kind of sick, like really sick and dying. 1978, Truss identified candida albicans and depression. Well, we hadn't put that together before in quite that way. 2007, Simonsini said cancer is a fungus. Hmm. Actually, that speculation has been around before, but he really articulated it. And what happens is, because we have these great unwashed illnesses, the ones that nobody has got a clear understanding about, we hop on the medical merry-go-round. Who knows what I'm talking about? Only a couple of you have been on the medical merry-go-round? Seriously? Simon, they're either awake, no, I'm not awake, or lying, one or the other, okay? Because, you know, there's a whole number of medical specialties because nobody steps back to see the big picture. It's like being a hamster on a wheel when you're a patient. You're just running hard and not getting very far. Who would agree with that? This is a slow crowd, but I'm working them. I'm working them. But wait, there's more. <laughs> I'm going to have them buying Ginsu knives and pots and pans. Here's the problem. Your doctors are clueless. Anybody agree with that? Yes. Why are they clueless? Remember, what they're looking at is the wall with termites. They can't see it. Why? Because it's not obvious. When things aren't obvious, there are two things you have to do. Number one, you have to listen. Number two, you have to investigate. Now, investigate can be tests, it can be laying on your hands, it can be do whatever, but you have to do those two things in order to figure out. And unfortunately, you can't do that in 7 to 15 minutes. Why not? Because it takes longer to listen and longer to investigate. The problem is the patients are clueless too. Why are the patients clueless? Because they haven't been educated to understand any of this, which is why you're here because the chance you have now is to actually educate your doctor. Who thinks health class was of any value in high school? Two people thought that was useful. Okay, good. They are probably PE health education teachers. Here's the problem. We have this solution for problems, drugs. We have this solution for problems, surgery. We have this solution Mm. That was because the other two solutions didn't work. We have disability. Don't worry, we have nursing homes so you can feel halfway comfortable. And then finally, you can get some relief. The tragedy is, how many people think this is really what happens? This is how we die. We die with the best of medical care. We die with the worst of medical care. Wait a minute, that probably means medical care might be irrelevant in a lot of the situations. You're going to die anyway. You're going to spend your fortune doing it. You're going to become broke doing it. You're going to lose your hope doing it because doing it is pretty much doing nothing. And that's what the drugs and surgery accomplish for you. But what if there is a solution? I mean, isn't that what you came here for? Apparently, they didn't get much of the solution in the last couple of days, Simon, because when they, you ask them what they learn, so am I really glad I'm here? <laughs> oh, that you had too much to drink last night. Mycotoxin, I might add. <laughs> Doug didn't talk about that? Or was that over drinks? <laughs> there are three great kingdoms. Okay. England, France, Spain, right? The three great kingdoms. No, not actually, but I did want to emphasize that fact. There's the plant kingdom, okay? The animal kingdom and the fungal kingdom. 
okay? What are the three kingdoms? England, France, Spain, right? Wrong. Plant, animal, fungus. Now, I'm, I'm putting it this way because I want you to be able to go home and tell your family, your friends, oh, your physicians, okay, what you really learned about how to get better, how to honestly get better. Because you see, who eats home becomes a very important piece of information. The plants make energy. They take sunlight. They make energy. The animals eat the plants to get the energy or eat other animals that ate the plants. That works too. That can actually be more fun. The nice thing is to be omnivorous like we are, and you can eat plants and animals, so you get the best of both of those worlds. There is an interesting exception to this. The Venus flytrap likes eating animals. That poor fly is done for. Actually, I think everybody should have many more Venus flytraps around. Just a thought. Fungus eats the plants. We're all aware of that, right? Fungus eats the animals. In other words, that third kingdom kind of consumes the other two. That makes it the king above all. Now, you have to remember something. It's nothing personal. It's just business. This is how the fungus kingdom survives. It has to eat the other two, or it dies. Nothing personal. You're just a happy meal. Okay? <laughs> Survive or die. Now, that's what we think in terms of our living and such. But the fungus kingdom, this is real damn important. It has to learn to get around to everything we can throw at it. So here's a fungal disaster. Okay? Here's a fungal disaster. Here's another one. Is it possible that fungus growing on us, it's nothing personal. It's just the fungus has to survive. Why do we get so worked up over that? I mean, you know, come on. See that little fungal disaster there? Very significant because everywhere we have a boundary, a biological boundary, this is a very important system inside human biology, okay? You go from a wet to a dry surface. You go from a soft to a hard surface. That's a very unique situation, and that's just ripe for the picking, okay? Anybody ever see toes look like that? Sure, all the time. I'll give you an example. Podiatrists. I, I have great friends who are podiatrists. I learned a lot about it when I was in medical school because we had a podiatric medical school right up the street. This stuff is not a localized problem. None of the ones I have shown you are localized problems. Now, they're in one locale, one location, one place. They are not limited to that place at all. Now, does that mean if you've got fungus on you, you've got fungus in you? Oh, uh, probably. Okay, I'm not going to make the gross generalization about every one of you, but about 99.9999% probably, you could be the exception. Is it a disaster, really? Well, onychomycosis is more than just a cosmetic problem. It can spread to other sites. It's a portal of infection for bacteria. It can lead to more severe problems such as cellulitis and gangrene. That's inflammation and death of the skin. When well, a wait a minute, you're attached on the other side of that skin. So that could be important. How do you know what's you and what's not you? Very simple, very simple thing. If you provide a blood supply to it, that's you. If you don't provide a blood supply to it, that's not you. Okay, so for instance, let's put a knee implant or a hip implant in. Is that you? No, it's in you, but it's not you. And that's a serious thing with regard to infections. Of course, when we say infection, what do we think? Bacterial. What should we think? Bacterial plus. Plus what? Plus fungus, plus parasites, plus viral, bacterial plus. See, the germ theory that Pasteur proposed, remember I talked about that in the beginning. Who remembers that I talked about that in the beginning? Very good. 17 people have been paying attention. That's good. 
I'm complimenting Simon because, you know, sometimes he doesn't really realize how much value he has created for people. Seventeen were listening in the beginning. That's great. So the deal is, is that when we talk about a portal of infection for bacterial infections, now, wait a minute, this, this is pretty serious because we are in a very tenuous balance while we are alive because everything wants to make us dead. Not, not personal, remember, it's just business. The fungus, the bacteria, the viruses, they're all making a wonderful living on us, okay? Now, while we're making a wonderful living exploiting our lives, they're making a wonderful living exploiting our life, all right? Now, that's the tenuousness. That's why medical care is such an important issue is because it's costing us our lives, but that's why health care should be so much more valuable because we move that balance, that tipping point toward optimization, toward enjoyment, toward vitality, and not all the nastiness. That's a fungal disaster. That person is going to see terminal events associated with just a fungus infection, leading to all the other deeper issues on the inside. You know, this is common for nursing homes. This is common for just homes. As people get older, their defenses go down. Oh, wait a minute. That could be their immunity is challenged. Their immunity is challenged long before this shows up. This is just localized example of how bad it has become on the inside. Their essential fatty acids are out of balance. Their minerals are out of balance. Their circulation is going down. Just Think about all of the whole constellation of problems. So when someone comes into my office, they don't have a localized problem. They have a localized flag that directs me toward what's going on systemically on the inside. And often, the flag that they have is not the one that brought them in to see me. Often, it's a little tiny sliver of the history. Or often, it's a little tiny observation when I'm checking them. That's the important thing, is to take that information and do something with it. Remember what I said in the beginning? Doctors are clueless. You know the most important treatment you can put on this? Cortisone. Isn't it? I mean, isn't that what you get? You go to the doctor. Well, I'm not a skin doctor. You need to see the dermatologist for that. Really? Aren't you a doctor doctor? No, I'm not. No, I'm a special doctor. I'm a specialist. And, uh, you know, I used to think that we would go to college to learn how to learn. And then you'd go to medical school so you could really learn about specific things in medical biology. And then I thought you went to specialty training so you could really calm down and learn a lot about that particular area. Then I learned what specialty training was all about. <laughs> you know, a generalist thinks he can fix what you've got. A specialist thinks you've got what he can fix. Let that sink in. A specialist thinks... <laughs> that you've got what he can fix. Why? You showed up there. You know, the nice thing about specialty offices is people bring in their organ, show it, and then take it out of the office instead of leaving it there. Think on that. There's another fungal disaster, very common. Common, common, common. That's a little psoriatic type pattern. What about inside? That's an aswallowman tube, otherwise known as an esophagus. Happily, if you're looking for the ulcer, you can bypass this and just go look for the ulcer. They do. They do. There's a fungal disaster. How about infection of the breast? Anybody ever hear about mastitis? Let's just infect, but it must be bacterial, right? Because remember, all infections are bacterial. That's what we think. They neglect the fungal, viral, parasitic, that go along with it. In other words, an infection is an infection, of course, of course, unless the infection, of course, of course, is a horse with, you know, bacteria and fungus and virus and parasites. And those who are not thinking of all of it miss it. Here's a wonderful disaster. That would be a kidney if it weren't being ate up with fungus. That would be a liver if it weren't ate up with fungus. Now, what about in the brain? Yeah, we hear about meningitis, okay. We think of meningitis as a bacterial infection, but in actual fact, numbers of them 
are fungus related. Anybody ever hear about the amoeba that people get from swimming in certain wild waters and then they get the amoeba and then they die in a few days because it eats up their brain? Is that a parasite? My golly, who to thunk it? All of the fungus, all of the bacteria, all of the viruses, all of the other bugs are parasites. It's a whole collection. It is not just a fluke or a worm or something like that. It's the collection of all these things are parasitic on us because they're eating us up. There's more of an example of all this stuff infecting us, and that's killing the brain. Oh, person did not volunteer this brain. That's because they were not able to protest, and that's what we can see. How about inside the bone? Because the bone marrow is a wonderful place to grow parasites including fungus. Now, what is an infection? We think of bacteria as, quote, infection. But then there's viruses, oh, we know about that. But then there's fungi. Now, we don't think of fungus as an infection because we've got so much experience with the bacteria and then certainly the viruses. And Everybody get their flu vaccine this year? Oh. She'll be seeing you for her flu. Anybody think that the flu vaccine does anything against the flu that's going around? Oh, it might actually. Well, you know, the thing is, is that it depends on how you do immunizations. My studies, my graduate studies in immunology started in 1968. That was about 22 years ago, if I do my math correct. So the deal is, is that what you need to understand is vaccinations can be extremely helpful and extremely useful, just not the way we do them. They're extremely profitable, to, excuse me, they're extremely, I, I just, I lose my, my train of thought when I start thinking like that, because we don't understand what vaccination really can do, so we don't do it, okay? You know, it's real important to let your kids play with dirt because they build up an immunity. It's real important to let your kids play around sick people because they build up an immunity. But only healthy kids do that. Sick kids get sicker, okay? How many of you avoid, you know, meats and cheeses and eggs and butter and such because you don't want to build your cholesterol up on the inside? Come on. They haven't been reading anything. Are you not educating them, Simon? Because <laughs> none of that has anything to do with cholesterol. None of that, and the cholesterol has nothing to do with blockage in the arteries, okay? And we've known this stuff for easily 25 years, okay? The damage in your arteries is scurvy. It's vitamin C deficiency, okay? And it's real clear how all that me mechanism works. Cholesterol is serving as a protectant. You need to have LP little a to serve as a flex seal over the injuries in the arteries. And what happens? Well, let's just dry the LDL down so we can't make any LP little a, why would we do that? All right, so back to bacteria. Of course they cause illness, and of course viruses cause illness, but of course you know what really causes illness is deficiencies and stress. We'll get to that. Okay, so what's a syndrome? I want you to see this is a collection of similar things, okay? Which of those would be apples? Well, there aren't any apples on there. Which of those could be uh, a, a, a pomegranate, uh, yep, there's, there's some of that there. But you see, it's a whole bunch of different things kind of, sort of, maybe going together. And they go together because they're circles, right? All right. But what on earth is a syndrome? Well, really, it's a collection, just like when a pelican scoops up a bunch of fish in his bill, he really doesn't care what brand they are, okay? He's wanting to eat fish. And the next scoop will be different fish. And the next one will be different fish. And it doesn't matter, because all he's after is fish. Now, when you hear about the yeast syndrome, well, what's it look like? It's a, it looks like a bill full of fish, OK? Because it doesn't matter. Every person has a different collection of symptoms, their own unique symptoms constituting their yeast syndrome. In other words, the weakest links in their chain are showing up with the symptoms in their body. 
and that will change over time from week to week and month to month, year to year. They will show different expressions, and it's all what? Yeast. Yeast is a fungus, okay? So the deal is, is don't get hung up, oh, your doctor, he missed your diagnosis because you have and I have. No, wait a minute. I got to tell you, first of all, if your doctor didn't call it yeast syndrome, he missed the diagnosis to begin with. When I say he, I mean she too. He, she, and I, whatever, okay? The, the whole point is, is that it's all yeast. Just the same way it's all parasites. And the reason is because yeast is a parasite. We are in this tenuous balance. We are all infected. Those of us who think we are not infected are wrong. That's what it is. We're the happy meal for all the rest of the biology. And so the syndrome that you get is whatever you get. It's still a demonstration of you on your way out, you being made a happy meal. So what we're looking at is cause and then effects. You know this domino is going to fall. How come? Because it's set up that way. And that's what happens inside your biochemistry. When something flicks your biochemistry at the beginning, you know it's going to be changing later on. So, for instance, if you are afflicted with, how about afflicted, afflicted, you like that one? That one's good. You're afflicted with low vitamin C, you know you're going to get artery disease. That's just going to be one of the effects we see later on. So when patients come to see me, I really don't care which domino brought them in. It's irrelevant, okay? That just brought them in. I'm looking for those first dominoes that fell because if I fix those, then it's easy to fix all the later ones because God built the system, and the system can repair. Why? How do we know it can repair? Because we're all in a very tenuous balance of staying alive. We're staying alive despite the fact everything else is trying to eat us. We're staying alive despite that. So all we have to do is put in three simple ideas. Number one, find what's blocking you from getting better whether it's yeast or parasites or dental infections, whatever, get rid of it. Number two, find what you're missing but you need, provide it. It makes sense, doesn't it? That way you can rebuild and repair and actually keep functioning. And the third thing is find what switches need to be flipped on and do it. Turn them on and then get out of the way. Let the system repair itself. That's what will take care of those dominoes, but not if they keep getting pushed down not if there's nothing to help lift them back up. Not if there's nothing to help keep them that way. Here's the problem. Yeast. Now, it's not the problem, but it pretty much is because, you know, we've been in a tenuous balance with yeast for all of our lives. And I'm talking millennia, okay? Because yeast grows on the inside, and that's why doctors, oh, well, we see that all the time. We see it in the stool cultures. We see it in the stool analyses. We see it, you know, when we look inside, whatever. What they don't realize is what's so obvious, and again, that becomes the elephant in the room. If we see it all the time, and the only people we're looking at are sick people, I wonder if yeast could be related to sick people. Ba-doom, bada-bing. Kind of innocent looking, doesn't really impress you too much, but that's really the root of illness. Now, the kingdom above others is yeast and fungus, mold and mildew. It's all the same thing. Plants, animals, fungus are all separated differently because of the way their energy systems work. Okay? So parasites are animals. They're little animals because they share the same kind of energy production system we do. Plants are completely different. Fungus is completely different. And the reason it's the kingdom above all others is because it eats us. Now let's talk about something called deep blood infections. See that pretty old biofilm there? That little biofilm is nasty because it's inside you. Now, we're having to rethink everything because when we were in medical school, they taught us you can't have infection inside the bloodstream. It's called sepsis and you're going to die. Okay? Well, the problem is we're starting to isolate infections floating around in the bloodstream. Now, biofilm is simply, think of it like this, kind of that kind of grimy coating inside your mouth. And if you don't believe it, don't brush your teeth for a day or two or three and run your tongue over. That's a clear-cut example of biofilm. All right? Now, what's important about biofilms is they're always moist. 
and they're growing everything. Bacteria, fungus, yeast, viruses, parasites, they're all growing there in the biofilm. Why? Because they're dividing up the tasks. Hey, you're good at doing this. You do that for all of us. We'll do this. And it's a community of organisms designed for their survival, not for yours. That's what's important. So here's an artificial hip, hip implant. It's got a biofilm on it. Your mouth, biofilm in it. Here's a catheter. You know what? We place tubes inside people to put IVs in, and they get infected with a biofilm. Coronary implants. Wait a minute. What do we call those? Stents. Duh. Okay. So are you beginning to get the idea that we have biofilms everywhere where we have a wet surface, that's where infection lives, and everywhere where we have an artificial surface inside us. Every artificial surface. Surfaces are infected. That's just the way it works. Now sepsis kills, okay? So you get an infection from your lung or your sinuses, Bacteria get in the blood, and they leak around, and they start damaging all the organs, and you die. Try and talk with your doctor about, I have a yeast infection in my blood. <laughs> no, because you'd be dead. Really? We suffer on the way, but we suffer in ways that are not obvious. Remember, the doctor looks at the wall full of termites and only sees his wood. Because it's not obvious behind that there is a deep-seated infection. And so you suffer, but that's all right. Don't worry, as you're crying out, we have drugs and surgery and so on. Is that serious right there? That's a gum infection. Now, I worked a lot with dentists, with the Biological Dentist Association. And I learned a lot about mouth and such. And guess what? Mouth and teeth, that's where it all starts. What if it starts there? All of it. Which part of it starts there? All of it. Now remember what I said in the beginning, your doctors are clueless? So are we as patients. So we're clueless as doctors, and we're clueless as patients, and we wonder why we die suffering with these infections and such. It starts here. Now remember, you know, we were telling kids you got to brush your teeth and such, and that's a real struggle. But that's okay, because we can poison you with fluoride. That's okay. Not a problem. Okay. Um, well, it's a, you know, the trade off is okay. You know, all okay. right? And we can put that in the water too, so that's good news. Deep dental infections here. This is the bottom of the tooth, the apex, so it's called an apical infection. Do the dentists see these? Yes. Do they recognize these? No. Why? That's just a lucency. I like to use a medical term here and there so that you remember. I'm a real doctor, which is scary in itself. But radiolucencies, that's just a hole. Unless it's filled with infection. Could that be filled with infection? I don't know. Is that one filled with infection? That's a root canal tooth. Why do you not want to do root canals? Because it's a dead tooth. Now it effectively acts like any other kind of implant inside you, the hip the coronary artery stent, any of those, now it's going to fester and grow nastiness right in there. Of course, it's not going to stay there. It's not going to stay there. It's going to travel. When it travels, it's going to leave this zone right here. Oh, it has direct access to a blood supply because all your teeth have access to a blood supply. So could it be that the energy meridians, there's a doctor here in the room. Raise your hand if you're here in the room and you check meridians. Oh, there he is right there in the front and right over there and right back there. Son of a gun. Could any of those energy meridians be reflecting what's going on deeper in? And could that be then a source or at least a complementary enhancer of problems going on inside you? Of course. Now, we can also get infections for yeast and fungus through inhaling because one of the neat things about a sinus is it is a blind alley. One way in, one way out. Okay. The problem with that is, is that, you know, if you get inflamed in the sinuses, you're going to get swelling in the membranes. Ooh, that's a bad problem because when you're swelling in the membranes, it's closing off the way out. Oops. 
Now we call that a puddle of pus. Okay, what grows in the pus? Infection. What kind of infection? Bacteria, fungus, viruses, parasites, and probably we'll need to start paying attention to prions and other things we don't even really know about yet. So, not Klingons, not Klingons. Who knows about prions? All right, you've been doing a good job on that at least, okay. But see, inhalation is a real serious issue because, oh my goodness, do things like this happen in lungs? Yes. Does that look like it could be infection? Yes. What could it be infection with? Fungus. How about right there? This kind of stuff gets serious. I mean, I want us to realize that contact certainly happens. You know, our skin is a boundary against the outside world, and it's always having a challenge with infections. But what we're looking at there is the possibility that these other things are going to get us sick. Not our genetics. Oh, well, I'm genetically weakened, and therefore I get more frequently ill. No, it's epigenetics. It's the balance that we establish in our life. That's at least 90% of what gets us sick. Now we cram ourselves full of antibiotics, birth control and other hormones. Cortisone's so good it's over the counter. Isn't it nice to put good things over the counter? Same thing at McDonald's. It's so good, it's over the counter. What a thought. How about food fake news? There's some fake news down there. The basics for healthy doctoring, I mean living, healthy living. Yeah, because see what happens is if you follow the food pyramid, you're going to be seeing the doctors. Why? Because you're ignoring these guys in the middle here. You're ignoring the oils. You know, we need oils. We need fats. Oops, we scratch that. We don't need the sweets. Fake fast foods. Good news is supersizing does not cost very much anymore. That's the fun part. How about stress? Could stress lead to cancer and heart disease and asthma and all these other things. Yeah, wait a minute, does that sound kind of like an infection? You could put infection right here and say it leads to heart disease, asthma, close to Wait a minute, this is start getting weird. How about poor sleep? How many of us believe poor sleep could contribute to illness? Sure, how many of us make sure we get enough sleep every night? Yeah, isn't that frustrating? I remember we're, we're not exactly clueless, but there are so many other fun things to do in life. Aren't there? <laughs> yeah. And, and especially I like the little refrigerators you can keep next to the couch now. So, so you don't have to walk too far for that next drink. Yeast, fungus, cancer, is there a connection? Well, that's a big, big question. Is cancer a fungus? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. If it's not a fungus, could it be confused with a fungus? You know, I'm, I think that, okay? If it's not a fungus, could it amplify? Could the fungus or yeast amplify cancer changes on the inside? Well, yeah, pretty sure that could happen. Now, a real si insight was acidosis. Dr. Samanichi said cancer is a fungus and said, Sodium bicarb is the answer for it. It's not completely the answer, okay? Is it part of the problem? Sure. Does acidosis happen? Well, let's put it this way. Babies are soft, rubbery, and smell good. Old folks are none of the same. <laughs> Babies are alkaline. Older folks are acidotic. So when he talks about acidosis, he's definitely talking about changes that we make with aging. And remember, the illnesses that we get with aging are degenerative illnesses, and cancer would kind of fall in that category. But wait a minute, what if all the degenerative illnesses are really infections? What if that great unwashed collection of illnesses that I talked about, well, we know about the bacterial infections, but what about if all these others are related to fungus, parasites, viruses, not just the bacteria that we think about, but all these other possible infections. Fungus is a cancer? Well, let me think. A balanced immune system handles the internal and the external threats and so on. If you overreact, you create autoimmune problems and allergies. If you underreact, you have more tendency for infections and cancer and hepatitis and HIV and shingles and stuff. 
Uh, I mean, I have to put up a wordy slide every once in a while just so you see. But you have to remember, fungus can't be that bad. I mean, it's, it's just, you know, it's just little grody toenails or whatever. It, it, it's just a little skin rash or something. But what if, what if it's that bad on the inside? What if it's going to kill you on the inside? Because the risks can kind of be surprising. Anybody notice that? You could fall out of that helicopter. Guess who's waiting to meet you? Yeah. How about those risks are very real? I mean, you know, we like to say when folks have, well, you know, they're going to the best. They're going to MD Anderson or Memorial Sloan Kettering or whatever, blah, 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 in, you know, that you have in your locale that is the best cancer hospital. What do they do with their patients? Bury them? Yeah. What do we do with all of our other patients? Bury them. So we're pretty inefficient. Nobody makes it out alive, I'll grant you that. But do we have to kill them in the process or just let them die? How about anything that threatens your life and health is important? And I would say that cancer looks like this. I would say that fungus looks like this. And people just don't get it. So is cancer an alien? No. No, it's just one of the changes that happens when we're going through being infected like this. It's just a greedy kingdom, okay? Remember, it's the top kingdom. Just keep calm and cure cancer by actually talking in terms of treating yeast. One of the town criers that we know about said there is a cancer-fungus connection, and I really credit, you know, Doug went back. Everybody recognizes Doug Kaufman, right? Raise your hand if you recognize Doug Kaufman. There's about 20 of you that need to meet him this morning. Raise your hand, Doug, so we see you. There he is. Okay, stand up so we see you. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> the cancer fungus connection. He literally went back to the old textbooks and old literature, hard to dig out because it's not in the computers. And he really started putting the connection together. Now, Warburg started in, in 1910, basically said all forms of cancer have two basic conditions, acidosis and hypoxia, the lack of oxygen. Cancer tissues are acidotic. The whole point is how their metabolism changes is profoundly important, and that's why we get sick. The science is real. Like I said, I had to put up you know, some real, real doctor slides so that you remember that part, okay? Aging and acidosis, wait a minute. Aging is acidosis. You gotta remember, aging is an illness happening one day at a time. Aging is an illness associated with our acidosis and happening one day at a time. And you've got to remember all these things. How about, who knows about CPAP and my doctor says I have sleep apnea and all that other stuff. Oxygen leading to the cancer and the multiple organ failure and the heart and so on. It's not a lack of air pressure, it's a lack of oxygen. Started studying that in 1993. Oh, wait a minute, hypoxia and cancer? Sleep apnea, cancer, wait a minute. Mm. Is it possible that because we have the fungus, we're changing our biochemistry that way? Here it is, malignant tumor. I had to put this up, remember? Doctoring, okay, doctoring. And those diseases, hardening of the arteries, arthritis, wound healing, cancer, all related to low oxygen levels. So remember, two things are certain in life, death and taxes. Actually, I want you to take, this is your take home message. Who's ready for the take home message besides the fact that doctors are clueless and patients are clueless? The front table is going to get the take home message then. There's three certainties in life, death, taxes, fungus. Let's repeat that, death, taxes, fungus, okay, good. Because we are wet, warm, and wonderful on the inside, and that's where fungus likes to grow. So it's, it's just when we talk about causes of cell injuries, we leave out infectious agents beyond bacteria. Oh, and, and some viruses, because we know cancers and viruses are related. But how about poisons? We've got over 100,000 unnatural chemical compounds, and if you really want to bet, I think the, the total is closer to about a million, okay? And the deal is none of those are ever tested. They're all over the environment, and it adds up to increased cancer. Why? It's damaging our immune systems. Now remember, these are pesticide warnings here, all these things that happen, like including death. Warning, 
when used as directed, pe pesticides kill well, as directed. Well, I'm going to use mine as it's not directed then, because if it's a, a little as bad like this, a lot must be better. But remember, your only line of defense is your immune system. Your only line of defense. Is it an immune system dysfunction, or is it a fungus? Hmm. Fungus jumps in and on. Opportunistic mycosis just means the fungus takes over whenever it gets a chance. Okay, whenever it gets a little toehold or foothold, they just let these few opportunistic fungal. Every one of them is opportunistic. So did your doctor mess up? Hmm. I mean, one claim is, I didn't make up this slide, they say your doctor's wrong 88% of the time. I would say that the percentage is low, but anyway, is that dermatitis or a deep fungus? Is it cancer or a deep fungus? My leukemia patient, her counts were 50,000. They're now 15 to 20, and we're just getting started on fixing her. Leukopenia is low white cell counts. Hers have been down around 1,500, 2,000. We're working on building them up now. Is it lupus or a deep fungus? Oh, wait a minute. Well, it can't be fungus because, you know, lupus is an immune system problem. Is it rheumatoid arthritis or a deep fungus? So it can't be, you know, rheumatoid arthritis. It's a fungus issue. Or the other way around. I can't remember anymore. It's getting confusing. Kidney disease or a deep fungus? MS? Oh, or a deep fungus. ALS? Same kind of thing. Diabetes? Or a deep fungus? You've got to remember, every time you have a bacterial infection, you have a fungal infection. The front row is the only one that got the answer right. Thank you, guys. I appreciate that. Immune system issues, underlying disease, acquired. They don't even call it fungal. But in actual fact, all of these can be related to fungus. So many problems. Identifying causes may be difficult, especially if you're not looking for it. Mm, there's a thought. So what causes cancer? Well, the International Agency for Research on Cancer classified naturally occurring aflatoxins. Wait a minute. That's fungus toxin causing cancer. So does fungus cause cancer? Well... There's some speculations because sugar, lactic acid, antifungal medications, gee, it seems like they kind of relate together. So have we been wrong? Is cancer a fungus and is it curable? I gotta tell you, you can ask my patients, that's another thought. 12 drugs approved for the treatment of systemic fungal infections. And they work against, well, systemic fungal infections, how's that? Fungus could be a cause of suffering. There's confusion when you look at x-rays. Is that a cancer? Well, we better treat it like one. What about changes in the tissues that look like cancer? You'll notice it doesn't show any infection changes there because if your viewpoint is, is that it's just a change and not an infection, you won't do it. So could fungus be cancer or could fungus cause cancer or is that all cancers or just some? Because see, we treat cancer with chemo and radiation and surgery and immunotherapy. What about antifungal therapy, or maybe even a combination would be dramatically more effective? These drugs certainly are among the ones that are anti-cancer, but those are antifungal drugs. Does that matter? Hmm. Remember, close counts in horseshoes, hand grenades, and shotguns. Okay? But actually, if you're close, that might be just good enough. It's kind of easy. This is the best book on the subject. Everybody got that down? This is the best book on the subject. Good, okay. A great introduction, 31 years old now. But how do we really treat these kinds of issues? Because, you know, if you've got that stuff roaming through your tissues, that fungus is serious. Our treatment still is like the old-fashioned biplane because we've just not got it figured out yet. We are blazing the trail. We are getting new information. We are driving through the thicket of figuring this all out. And it is going to be a rocket ride when we get all the final answers. And we are really close. Would you agree, Dr. Cowden, we're close? Would you agree, Dr. Yu, we're close? We're getting there, aren't we? We're real close. These combined infections are the ones that are getting us because you go to people who are one-trick ponies. They only see that part of the problem. You've got to treat the whole problem because the risks are very real. They are seriously real. So, death by doctor. Can you blame those who don't know? I mean, literally, can you blame your doctors? You went to them. You know, they didn't find you. You went to them. What about... Doctors who don't know. What about patients? 
who don't know? Then are you responsible? I kind of think it's your responsibility to learn about things like this conference and then go share it with your family and friends. So exactly who is to blame? That comes down to the question. Well, Mark Twain had it right. He said, eat a live frog first thing in the morning. Nothing worse will happen to you for the rest of the day. <laughs> Thank you kindly. You've been a wonderful audience.